So uh, if everyone's okay, I'm going to remove my mask now. Um, okay, so continuous combinatorics. So let's start with this word. What, what does continuous combinatorics mean? Uh, because if you might know, combinatorics is the study of discrete structures. So when I say continuous combinatorics, what do I mean by that? Well, uh, it is uh, the study of typically large discrete structures, but using tools of, uh, that are typically associated with continuous structures, such as analysis, measure theory, topology, you name it. Now, uh, this area first started kind of under the name of graph limits, uh, but now this name is not exactly adequate because we have now produced limits that are not only for graphs. So now we're trying to use this name continuous combinatorics. But the question that started with graph limits is, if I have a very large graph, can I instead encode it by some sort of continuous structure? Continuous here is not really continuous in the sense of topology, but just it is not discrete. Um, more precisely, uh, if I let this quantity here be the number of copies of a graph G in a graph H, if I think that H is a very, very large graph, can I instead encode this H in some sort of structure that is kind of continuous, it's not like a graph, uh, but in this structure, it, there's a natural definition of this density. Now, uh, the answer to this question, whether I can actually encode this thing is obviously yes, because I'm giving this talk here. Uh, and it was answered by Lovis and Segedi, they encoded these large <laughs> graphs, graphons, which are uh, symmetric measurable functions from the square to the interval. And the way that you want to interpret a graphon is it as if it was uh, an adjacency matrix of a, of a graph over the interval, but you're allowed fractional edges. And the intuition is that WXY is going to be the probability that X and Y are connected. And if you have this intuition in mind, it's very easy to compute uh, densities of finite graphs in this graphon uh, via integration. It's very easy to come up with, with a very natural formula. Now, uh, as I said, uh, now we're using this name continuous combinatorics because we can produce limits of things that are better than graphs, uh, more general than graphs. So the, the real question that we're interested in in continuous comb combinatorics is, can we encode a large combinatorial object, an arbitrary large combinatorial object, whatever that is, by a limit object? Now, what do I mean by a combinatorial object? Uh, for us, it's a model of a fixed universal first order theory in a finite relational language. If you know what this is, very nice. If you don't know what this is, the important property that you need is that it's a class of objects in which uh, you, you take this object, it has a vertex set. If you restrict your attention to some subset of the vertice vertices, then it's another object of your class. So for example, um, oh, and the reason why you need this is because you want to make sense of these normalized number of copies of one object in, in, in another. For example, here are some classes that are actually these universal first order theories, whatever that is, if you don't know. Uh, we saw graphs, but you could talk about k-uniform hypergraphs, linear orders, permutations, colorings of sets, triangle-free graphs. A bunch of natural combinatorial objects are captured by, by these notions. Now, um, we're going to talk about limits, so I need to say what does it mean to, for, to have a convergence sequence. So if I have this fixed universal theory or this class of objects, uh, a sequence of objects there is convergent if the sizes are going to infinity. So we want to capture this large combinatorial object by taking a sequence that whose size is going to infinity. And every time I get a fixed combinatorial object M and I compute the density in the sequence, it gives me a sequence of numbers and I require them to be converted. So for each M, I get a convergent sequence here. And um, there's no assumption of uniformity of convergence or anything. It's just each M gives me a convergent sequence of numbers. And the question again is, can we encode this limit object, uh, this convergence sequence by a limit? Uh, what is the limit of this sequence? So let's revisit Elovas and Segedi's theorem. It was just saying graphons actually are capturing uh, limits of convergence sequences of graphs. In a very uh, strong way, uh, if I give you a convergence sequence of graphs, then it converges to a graphon. But not only that, but if I give you a graphon, it is the limit of some convergence sequences, of, uh, some convergence sequence of graphs. Uh, now, as I said, we want to do this for general graphs, and people have done this in an ad hoc way first uh, for theories like directed graphs, hypergraphs, permutations, uh, but later uh, some other theories appeared that 
handle the general case where you have just this arbitrary universal theory and then you can produce limits. So we have theory of flat algebras, we have L limits, and we have peons here. Now, uh, I'm not really going to talk too much about how do you define these limit objects because they're quite technical, but let me put this uh, picture here. Uh, these are all different types of limit objects that you can uh, construct, and they are not exactly equal. They all capture the limit, but they, they vary in, in what they look like, and uh, this is quite important. So I, I, like, to, I like to put this, these objects in this picture where kind of like the vertical axis is saying finite versus infinite, the more infinite is your limit object, uh, you have more tools of analysis, measure theory, et cetera, to, to handle them, to, to, uh, to try to prove theorems. And the more finite it is, the more connected to the convergence sequences uh, they are. So they allow you to pull back some results back to the finite. And there's also like this horizontal axis where you have synthetic or more algebraic limits in which the, the limit is very minimalistic and captures just the minimal amount of information. And because it's minimalistic, um, it's very easy to, to manipulate uh, synthetically, algebraically. But on the other hand, you lose a lot of the intuition of uh, semantics and, geomet uh, and geometry. And this is where the other limits here on this side uh, have some advantage. Now, instead of talking about the limit objects themselves, I'm going to focus uh, on why should you care about these different limit objects, right? If I, if I define one limit object, why should I care about defining another limit object? Well, uh, the reason is because uh, limit objects, they yield uh, asymptotic results in the finite. And different kinds of limit objects are necessary to prove different kinds of theorems. Uh, so, uh, so here are some examples of theorems that you can prove in the finite based off of uh, using this theory in the limit. So you can prove regularity lemmas uh, by using this limit theory. You can prove some extreme combinatorics results, and we can prove some quasi-randomness results, which will be uh, the focus of the second part of the talk. So any questions so far? Um, OK. So let's talk a little bit. Oh, go ahead. If, if such a limit exists, is it usually unique in some way? Um, uh, that's a very good question. This is uh, the topic of uh, uniqueness theorems. So uh, typically, when you do a synthetic uh, limit object, uh, it is going to be unique just because it's a very minimalistic object. But if you go to a semantic object, there will be a uniqueness theorem in a different way that you say two limits represent the same, uh, the, the limit of the same sequences if and only if something holds. So for graphons, it is a, you can use it either cut norm or you can use uh, some measure preserving functions to say when two graphons represent the same limit. But it is a very good question. Uh, it is one of the big things that you prove when you come up with a new limit object is when do two limit objects represent the same limit? Um, okay, any more questions? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about quasi randomness. So quasi-randomness, in the same way of limit theory, started with the theory of graphs. And uh, so let's talk a little bit about quasi-random graphs. Uh, these are graphs that look random. What do I mean by look random? They look like GNP, so uh, the random graph in which each edge is present with probability p. And the upshot of the theory is that there are several typical, there are several properties that you see of typical outcomes of the GNP that look very different, but when you look at them, uh, as properties of a deterministic graph sequence, they turn out to be equivalent. So let me give you uh, the main theorem, or at least part of the main theorem, and it's even not actually the theorem that appears in the literature, it's kind of like through modern eyes. Uh, so the following are equivalent for a sequence of finite graphs of increasing sizes. So the first is the definition of quasi-random. Uh, it says that uh, there exists some density P, some edge density P such that Every time I give you a finite graph and you try to compute the density of this graph in my, in my deterministic graph G, you see what you would see in expected value in G and P, except for some error that goes to zero as it goes to infinity. Now, of course, this error has a dependence on H uh, that I'm hiding here, uh, because otherwise it doesn't even make sense, but that's the definition of quasi-random. So it looks like the random case in terms of computing densities of subgraphs. Now, here's a different property that is also typical, uh, is also true of typical outcomes of GNP, uh, but looks very different than this, but turns out to be equivalent, which is unique inducibility. So this is like this, uh, you give me a set, as long as it's non-negligible size, so it has a constant relative size of your graph, if you try to compute the density of any finite graph 
in restricted to this set. So there is this large graph here. You restrict your attention to here. Compute the density here. You approximately see the same thing as you as if you computed the density in the whole thing. And it turns out that just requiring that this sort of um, unique inducibility is equivalent to saying that all the densities mu must match what you see in the random case. Now, here's another different property that is slightly uh, looks very different, but uh, is also equivalent, which is unique orderability. Say that I order the vertices of my graph. Uh, now I have an ordered graph in my hands. So if I have an ordered graph, I can now compute densities of ordered graphs in this. So not only do I require edges and non-edges to be preserved on, on edge on this density, but I also require the order to be preserved. And when I do this, what I see is that it behaves independently. If I try to compute the density of an ordered graph, I see the density of the graph part times the density of the order part. So it is as if these things were completely independent and I was ordering at random. Even if I try to order adversarially, I get an order that looks as if I was ordering at random. Uh, so it turns out that this is also equivalent to the previous two properties. Uh, and here's a different one, which is similar to this unique orderability, which is unique to orderability. So instead of ordering, you now partition the vertices into red vertices and blue vertices. You compute densities of red, blue colored graphs. And again, you see the density of the graph part times the density of the coloring part. Now, there are several other items in this theorem, but I'm not going to state them here. They're very different. They're even more different than this one, these items that I'm presenting. But in any case, the, what I want uh, here is to ask the following question. Can we generalize uh, this quasi-randomness theory for, uh, of graphs to more general combinator objects in the same way that we do uh, for limit objects? And again, it turns out that the answer is yes. Uh, people have done this in an ad hoc way in the literature uh, for tournaments, hypergraphs, permutations. But uh, in fact, we were able to do this for also general objects in the same setting, like universal theories. Uh, with what we call the natural quasi-randomness theory. So before I talk about natural quasi-randomness theory, let me uh, show you how do you see these things uh, in the limit. So here's the same theorem, but stated using graph one. So uh, the first item, which is quasi-randomness, actually is very easy to state. You just say the limit graph one is a constant function, except for zero measure set. Uh, unique inducibility, what you're asking is that if I restrict my attention to some non-negligible set of vertices, it converges to the same limit, right? So the, this original sequence converges to W, you restrict to any subset, it still converges to W. Uh, unique orderability, it's saying that there is only one way of ordering. So if I give you two sequences of order graphs, such that the graph part converges to W, then these guys need to converge to the same limit of ordered graphs. Uh, and the same thing for colorability, but with, with colorings. So that's how you see this in limit version. Now, if you don't understand anything of that, what I want you to get out of this is this informal version. Uh, Quasi-randomness means all label densities match the random case. Unique inducibility means subobjects of my limit object look like my limit object. Um, unique orderability says linear orders think that this thing is random. And unique true colorability think that this uh, two colorings think that W is random. So that's, that's the informal version I want you to keep in mind. So let me uh, give you what we can prove in the general case. So this is the, the big theorem of unique couplability. Uh, so the following are equivalent for a sequence now of arbitrary combinator objects of a fixed uh, universal theory. So the first is unique two colorability. So two colorings think that this thing is random. The second is unique order but So linear order thinks that this is random. So this is not a special thing about graphs. It's true for any sort of sequence. If, if, if you can fool two colorings and they think you're random, you can also fool linear orders. And in fact, this is part of a much more general thing, which is uh, every limit object of rank at most one think that this sequence is random. Now, I'm not going to talk, uh, I'm not going to explain what rank one is, uh, but uh, here are some examples of things that are, have rank at most one. They all are going to be they are going to think that the sequence is random. So for instance, permutations, cyclic or linear orders, C colorings, so not only two colorings, but any number of colors, uh, and graphs with bounded VC dimension. So these are all things that yield limits of rank at most one. Now, there are other items here uh, that are kind of analogous to the quasi-randomness of the graph case, but I'm not going to get into details. Now, if you're paying attention uh, to, the, to the top of this theorem, you might see that there's a one here. And the reason why there's a one here is because there's actually an L there, because you can prove a more general version of this theorem 
that talks about higher versions of quasi-randomness. And in fact, what you can show is that um, if you can fool every uh, one, one, at least one quasi-random K hypergraph on every arity at most L, then you can actually fool uh, everything of rank at most L. And again, rank is this abstract notion. And here are some examples of things of rank at most L, L hypergraphs, orders on L tuples, L plus one hypergraphs with bounded BC dimension, and there's many others, but they're more complicated. And again, there are graphs, this is not this is the same notion. Uh, for graphs, if you're talking about U couple two, there are only two limit graphs that satisfy U couple two, which is the complete graph and the empty graph. So your quasi-randomness notion is so strong uh, that uh, only trivial things survive. Because think about this, right? If I give you a random graph, GNP, right? Uh, GNP itself doesn't think it's random because you can put GNP on top of GNP and it doesn't look like a random thing, right? It looks like two graphs, one on top of the, of the other, right? It's one is an edge if and only if the other is an edge, right? So, so GNP doesn't think it's random. It's kind of, it can, it can see information about itself, but a coloring cannot. If you try to color the vertices into red and blue, it still looks like the red part is random and the blue part is random. So that's kind of the idea here. Uh, uh, okay, and, but in any case, uh, from the graph case, you might be wondering about unique inducibility, which was the other version that we talked about. So in, in the graph case, unique inducibility was that thing of saying sub-objects of my limit object look like the same limit object. For graphs, it was equivalent to unique colorability and all these things that they classified on this U couple one. But it turns out that in general, this is not true. Uh, in general, it's a proper class. And here's a very stupid example. If you take the linear order, it's obvious that if you restrict to any subset, it still looks like the linear order. But it's also obvious that it's not unique to, to colorable because color the first half with red vertices and it does not look like uh, the random coloring of, of this object. Um, so this is an actual proper class. And in fact, you can prove a very nice uh, series of implications and separations. And that's e there's even a third hierarchy called independence, but I'm not going to get into details because it requires some technical definitions. And you can prove these, these implications. And mo all these implications uh, are actually strict. Uh, if On some theory, they are strict. So if you restrict your attention only to graphs, then of course, they're not uh, strict because uh, these things are equivalent for graphs. But, but for general theories, they're not equivalent. Um, okay, but uh, that's about it about uh, quasi-randomness. Uh, let me finish with this slide. Uh, you might be wondering, right? So uh, we proved this, uh, these nice theorems about natural quasi-randomness, and we, I said that I used uh, some limit theory to do that. Uh, so you might be wondering, what is, in my opinion, the best limit object? And you might be expecting this answer, and the answer is it depends. Uh, it depends on what you want to do. Uh, because, and even if you want to do something specific, it might be that you need more than one. So for example, to prove these natural cause randomness results, we actually use three types of limit objects at the same time. We use these theons, flag algebra homomorphisms, and local exchangeable arrays. Uh, but th this does not mean that these three are better than ultra products, because if you want to prove things like regularity lemmas, it's much more convenient to work with ultra products and a little bit with theons. Uh, and if you want to do something like extreme combinatorics results, it's very convenient to work kind of like on the left half of this, which is the synthetic and algebraic stuff, because it's, it's kind of the, the minimalism of synthetic approach is very useful for extreme combinatoric results. Um, so th that's what I had to say. So let me uh, leave this slide uh, for a couple of seconds here, which is some projects that I'm working on or have worked on in the recent uh, past. Uh, but that, that's all that I wanted to say. So uh, thank you all. Any questions? So, so in are there natural examples where the quasi-random objects have extremal properties, like oh, yes. some class of test? Yes. Uh, so, so for example, one of the things that I am working on is uh, Sidorenko's conjecture. So Sidorenko's conjecture says that um, take, take a bipartite graph, right? And compute the non-induced density of this bipartite graph. Sidorenko's conjecture says the least density you can see is the same density that you see in the quasi-random case, right? Uh, now, there's also another conjecture, which is called the forcing conjecture that says if your bipartite graph uh, 
further uh, has at least one even cycle, right? You cannot have an odd cycle, it's bipartite. But if it has at least one cycle, then this is the only minimal, uh, which is also open. It's much harder than Sidranko's conjecture, but, but there are many examples where the quasi random is the stream. To give a different example, uh, in the theory of tournaments, um, there's also the quasi random tournament. And uh, you can prove that uh, if you're trying to minimize the number of transitive tournaments, then this is attained by the quasi random tournament. And if your transitive tournament you're trying to minimize has size at least four, this is the only minimum. So, so, so their quasi randomness is actually a very good guess for extremal, for extremal case. There's also like common graphs as well, like this and et cetera. The other question? So is there a notion of quasi-randomness for bounded degree graphs? Uh, yes, oh, I should say. So most of the things that I talked here is what is called the dense setting. So, so for instance, talking about graphs, uh, edge density needs to be non negligible so about n squared. Uh, but people have been studying uh, sparse symmetry <laughs> uh, and trying to understand that. But uh, the starting point of limit theory is actually quasi randomness. That was the motivation. And so the starting point of sparse limit theory, you should start, start understanding quasi randomness in, in the sparse case. And of course, bounded degree is of particular interest, uh, especially regular, right? The regular is particularly interesting uh, because of expanders and et cetera. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, speaker.